Impact of distal output track modulation on IOP. First, distal output track resistance. What's the location and what is the substrate? Two, high resolution analysis of distal output track structures. Third, I want to talk about canalograms with fluorophores. Fourth, about live imaging of outflow vessels with SDOCT, and give you an outlook finally um, about computational fluidics and development of a predictive outflow test. There is an unexplained high IOP after TM ablation. When you remove the trabecular meshwork here with a trabectome, you would expect the intraocular pressure to drop to the level of episcular veins. That would be about eight millimeter mercury. However, that only happens in one out of 300 patients here in this study. Um, the baseline IOP in fact correlates with the post ablation IOP before drops are started. So that suggests that there must be some outflow resistance that can be quite significant in some patients. High resolution analysis of distal outflow tract structures. Using a ribbon scanning confocal microscopy with 200 nanometers resolution, we scanned through whole eyes meandering down in a Z stack, which created 4.3 million TIFF images. It took 64 hours of scan time and six hours of assembly time. That can be done on any computer. We had to use a supercomputer cluster and the file size was quite respectable, 1.6 terabytes. One also can't just scan any eye, not a living eye certainly, and not a, um, an enucleated eye. One has to clear the eye and uh, that took some trial and error. Uh, with a clearing solution, but you can see here how transparent the entire eye is after this protocol. Ribbon scanning of focal microscopy um, of the porcine eye showed us that there are many tiny structures that we didn't quite expect based on conventional histology. First, we thought these are artifacts, but um, we're using lactins here perfused into the anterior chamber. So this is where the dye flows and these are functioning collector channels. So many of those would be overlooked or misinterpreted on conventional histology. One can zoom in, of course, to a much greater detail um, because confocal microscopy goes down to subcellular levels. In the human eye, um, first, um, the appearance is somewhat similar, but when you look at the segmentation now, yellow being Schlem's canal and the trabecular meshwork, red being the collector channels, and blue the um, connecting episcleral veins and uh, further distant outflow vessels, it becomes apparent that the collector channels are longer, much longer, spanning several clock hours. However, they are equally complex compared to the pig. They can branch out, make peculiar curves and bends, and are just very complex structures. The volumes are regionally different. Um, first, the largest volumes are contained, as one would expect, in the um, superficial venous plexus. Collector channels are tiny, uh, and so that's reflected here in the volume chart. The TM and Schlems canal do, do contain a respectable volume as well. There, the nasal ones seem to be largest, nasal TM and nasal Schlems canal. That is not the case with the collector channels, however. Um, but again, in the superficial venous plexus and um, red-coated additional vessels, again, the nasal vessels are the biggest. There are considerable intra uh, inter-individual differences. I1 here shows you fairly large, curving, bending, uh, probably collapse, uh, collapsible, uh, collector channels. In this individual, you have many tiny ones everywhere. So rare ones, big ones in this one, and really tiny ones 
in I number two. When one summarizes this, it is interesting to see that the proximal vessels are larger compared to the distal ones. The proximal collector channels are also more, uh, sorry, less elliptoid, so they're more round shaped. And the distal ones are more oval, and we interpret this as perhaps being more collapsile, and if that is the case, then perhaps they could provide the outflow resistance that we're looking for. Canalograms for fluorophores. We use fluorescein in this pig eye that looks into the camera. You can see an uh, early nasal filling that then flows around or then starts filling elsewhere. When the nasal trabecular meshwork is removed, there's a very rapid filling nasally that then washes around towards the temporal site. This is apparent here in this overlay heat map of six eyes, rapid filling nasally, but also faster filling temporally. In fact, nasally there is a 17 to 14 fold increase, while nasally there is a two to three fold increase of outflow speeds. One can also look at the uh, single collector vessels or larger, um, larger drainage vessels. The size of a dot and the color of a dot indicate speed and amount of chromophore flowing out here. One disadvantage, of course, is if you wanted to use this as a clinical test, one would have to be invasive and inject a dye in a patient, uh, that's one disadvantage. The other one is that if this is a patient with glaucoma, presumably the trabecular meshwork would also be less permeable, so would not really allow you to assess the distal outflow function. Light imaging of outflow vessels with SD-OCT. Here we found that this allows us to observe in living eyes, the diameter of vessels, and they do dilate uh, both these schlems like elements and the collector channels. When nitric oxide is given, one can segment out uh, single trees, collector trees. Uh, and what we found were almost pinch valve-like elements that seem to dilate and release or become patent and allowing flow after being exposed to nitric oxide. This dilation causes the pressure to drop, as you can see here, after removal of the trabecular meshwork. Of course, the pressure drops also with the trabecular meshwork, but the real surprise was that there is a pressure drop after TM removal. The cross-sectional area increases in average um, and when you give a vasoconstrictor, you can also constrict these vessels. Natarsidil, a rokinase inhibitor that lowers pressure clinically, does so by making the TM permeable, but when the TM is removed, you can still see a pressure drop. This dilation that uh, this substance causes is not just rapid, but it actually continues over quite some time. With an increasing vessel diameter over this entire fairly long time course. Outlook. Computational fluidics is something we explored. This is challenging. It can pinpoint um, areas of high flow resistance, however. The goal is to compute the outflow for the entire outflow tract, not an easy feat. Clinically, the more relevant question, however, is how can you predict how much flow will occur in a patient when the trabecular meshwork is removed? Will the collectors function or will they not function? Uh, we think we do have a test. This is a, an ex vivo pig eye model. We've done this also in human patients, but we don't have enough data to show that just yet. But here in 16 eyes, we see that after we deploy a test, that there is a pressure drop that predicts whether after clinical ablation of the 
trabecular mesh work and whether there will be outflow or not. In summary, we talked about the location and substrate and said this is probably going to be in the collector channels. There might be pinch valves. There are areas of high outflow resistance that look especially convoluted and that can be um, seen and, and, and traced with chromophores. Um, one can also observe areas to dilate that then cause this additional pressure drop. As an outlook, uh, we are playing with computational fluidics, uh, something quite complex, uh, and we are currently developing a predictive outflow function test. I want to thank my entire lab and all our collaborators and of course the funding bodies of this work. Thank you for your attention.